This is the longest international border in East Asia, the China-Mongolia border. The border is 4,630 kilometers long, unlike China's much shorter but extremely violent borders with India. This northern border with Mongolia is fairly quiet, and out of the 4,630 kilometers, about 70% of that border lies in the special autonomous region of China, called Inner Mongolia. And this is not just any autonomous region, there's something very special about it. Inner Mongolia is gigantic. It doesn't look cute on the map because, well, Russia, China, and Mongolia are all enormous. But in reality, Inner Mongolia is larger than France, Germany, and the United Kingdom combined. And the region spans so much that there is a two-hour time difference between east and west, and different seasons between north and south. Up here at northernmost tip of Inner Mongolia, the temperature can get as low as minus 58 degrees Celsius in winter. But down south, near the Gobi, the temperature can get as high as 43 degrees Celsius. Inner Mongolia borders seven provinces, one autonomous region, and two countries, which is another extremity because no other territories of China border this much. Another very interesting fact about Inner Mongolia is that this autonomous region was founded in 1947, more than two years before the founding of the People's Republic of China. But how is an autonomous region of a country older than the country itself? And if you look at the maps of Inner Mongolia over time, it gets even more interesting. This is Inner Mongolia in the 1800s. This is what it looked like in 1928. And in 1947, it became this. And by 1958, its size had more than doubled. Then, since 1969, it suddenly shrank to this tiny little thing. And after 1979, it took back all this land. But why? Why did the size of Inner Mongolia change so drastically, so many times? And at the eastern border of the two Mongolias, you will find this weird looking line running through Bear Lake, leaving Inner Mongolia only 7% of the lake surface area. But where did this line come from? What's the story behind it? I think some questions must be answered. How did this 4,630 km border become a reality? What exactly happened between the two Mongolias? And more importantly, how did Mongolia? In the Mongolia autonomous region houses in the Mongolia's primary objectives. There are more Mongols living in China than in Mongolia. Mongolia. Split into two. So to answer these questions, and as a Mongolian Chinese myself, I went on a month-long journey to Inner Mongolia and Mongolia to find out the truth behind them. And through the conversations with Mongols from both Mongolias, I think I learned something truly remarkable about the division of Mongolia. Let's get into it. Before we get into this, let's quickly go over geography of Mongolia. And when we are talking about the geography of Mongolia, what we are really talking about is this, the Gobi, the largest desert in Asia. The word Gobi is Mongolian, it literally means regions without water, which is perhaps not something you can relate to when you think of civilization. But let's just say the Mongolian civilization is quite unique and the Gobi played a vital role in Mongolian civilization. As it geographically divided the Mongols into four branches, the ones who lived west of the Gobi were referred to as the Western or the Dunga Mongols. Those living southwest of the Gobi on the Tibetan Plateau were the Upper Mongols, 
The ones who lived south of the Gobi were the Inner Mongols, and those who lived north of the Gobi were the Outer Mongols. And our story today is mainly about the relations between Inner Mongols and Outer Mongols. Not because Upper Mongols and Western Mongols are unimportant, for the record, they are very, very important. They're actually why Xinjiang and Tibet are part of China today. But they just don't really exist anymore. I will explain. Across the border, to the land of Mongolia. The Gobi Desert is eating this entire city alive. Sand. So the Gobi divided Mongols into four branches. For hundreds of years, they lived side by side. You know, there were wars and chaos, of course, but there were also brief unification and prosperity. This cycle repeated for hundreds of years until one group of people walked out of the dense forests of Manchuria and changed everything. And to understand the division of Mongolia, we kind of have to cover their story first because, you see, it might appear to you that the Gobi divided the Mongols geographically into four, but it was actually these people from Manchuria that made the division a reality. If you are unfamiliar with East Asian history, you probably haven't heard of the Manchu people. Well, comparing to the Mongols' popularity in the world, the Manchus are a bit lesser known. But to everyone in East Asia, be it Korean, Chinese, Japanese, Vietnamese, Thai, or even Russians, the Manchus had a much bigger impact on their history than the Mongols. And the Mongols themselves one of the most ferocious peoples on this planet was under their direct control for nearly 300 years until 1912. But who were these people, right? And how, how did they do that? So the Manchus started their journey in Manchuria, and they had been at war with the Mongols since the 10th century. The Manchus rose to power first and founded a great empire called Jin in Manchuria. The empire expanded quickly and ruled over northern China. The Manchus were great warriors, good at training, and had a very good relationship with their Chinese subjects. If nothing had gone wrong, this empire could have existed for a very long time. But as they were expanding their territory into the Mongolian plateau, they crushed a Mongol tribe and had their Khan brutally executed. The Manchus didn't pay much attention to this because it was war, and war kills people. But there was just one miscalculation. The Manchus didn't kill everyone in that tribe. And two generations later, in 1162, a boy was born into the same Mongol tribe. And he looked like this. I actually think he's one of those guys who needs no introduction, but in case you don't know Chinggis Khan, he was the founding Khan of the Mongol Empire, which later became the largest contiguous land empire in the history of this planet. Chinggis is very famous. I mean, if you go to Mongolia or in Mongolia, you can't miss his face. It's in the city, on the money, on the wall of an internet state that is everywhere. Anyway, Chinggis is important. And he also completely crushed Manchus. The Jin Empire was wiped out and Mongols killed over 70% of its population. They killed so much that at one point, the entire North China Plain was nearly empty. Hello viewers, this is the Asian capital of the Mongol Empire, Arahulan. Chinggis Khan founded this city, Krakrom himself. He gathered all the troops, the buildings here, all over this valley. So after Chinggis passed away, his son, Ogodai, built a wall around the city. But after Ogodai passed away, Kublai and his rivals started a war. They all want to be the Khan of the Khans. And the city was completely demolished during that war. Kublai somehow, you know, reconstructed this place, but 
he moved most of his uh, uh, political structure and administration to Kambalik, further south, which is also known as Beijing. But now this is uh, this is what's left of Karakalom. And this appears to be the actual wall of the old capital of Karakalom. Still here. And that's the only thing that is left of this once the most important capital in the world. I think this is part of the floor of the Asian capital, the Asian palace. Hard to believe, 800 years ago, 900 years ago, it was here, on this land, commanding his army to conquer the world. Who would have known Chinggis, the greatest Khan of all the Khans? How could he even imagine one day his city, his capital, would end up like this? Not even a trace left. It's just gone. Who would have known Beijing, Kambalik, Kukwai's pride and joy would end up a Chinese city? <laughs>。But the late 16th century, the Great Mongol Empire was no more. It disintegrated into many small khanates and tribes. Meanwhile, in the land of Manchuria, a great man was born. This guy was as important as famous to the Manchus as Chinggis to the Mongols. And in many ways, this Manchu guy had a much longer and bigger impact on the Mongols than the great Chinggis himself. Because his Manchurian empire and descendants not just avenged themselves on the Mongols, they conquered them. His name was Nurhachi. And his empire, later known as the Qing Empire, would become China's largest and the last imperial dynasty. And Qing's conquest of the Mongols was nothing short of a miracle. The project took six legendary Manchu emperors in a row, more than 130 years, to finish. So while the Mongols were fighting among themselves, Nurhachi rose to power quickly in Manchuria. And the neighboring Mongol tribes started to get involved in wars with the Manchus. Sometimes Manchus helped the Mongols fight other Mongols, sometimes the other way around. And soon, the Manchu and Mongol nobility in this region began to marry each other. At the time, there was one very powerful Mongol tribe that dwarfed all other tribes, the Chahar Mongols. And they didn't like this growing intimacy between the Manchus and the Mongols. So they punished the Mongols that went too close to the Manchus to teach them a lesson. But apparently, one of those lessons went a bit too far. In 1625, the Chaharj killed seven Horch nobles brutally, and immediately the Horch Mongols allied with Nurhachi for protection, becoming the first Mongol tribe that submitted to the Manchus. Nurhachi and his sons were like, hey, this could be it. This could be the key to bringing all the Mongols to our side. They took advantage of the conflicts among the Mongol tribes, kept marrying Mongols, and this strategy just kept working. After Nurhachi passed away, his son Hontaji succeeded in his position and annexed every single Mongol tribe south of the Gobi. In 1627, Naiman and Ohun Mongols submitted. In 1628, Harachin Mongols submitted. Soon after, Zalut Mongols submitted. In 1630, Dorvut and Aruharchin Mongols submitted. Two years later, Angnud Mongols submitted. In 1632, Hongdeji defeated the Chaharis. Within the same year, Momeng and the Wulet Mongols submitted. In 1634, Chahar, Aksindun, Bordus, and Tumut Mongols submitted. A few years later, Ujmuchin, Sonid, and the Bok Mongols also submitted. And that is how Inner Mongolia was formed. This line between Inner and Outer Mongolia, well, most of it, is almost 400 years old. But Outer Mongols were way more reluctant to come under Manchu's rule. They had established close ties with the Qing Empire, but had effectively remained self-governing and would like to stay that way. But you see, what they want doesn't really matter because another power, Vest of the Gobi, had already set his eyes on them.
Unlike the inner Mongols who lived in the frontier and had to deal with the Chinese insurgencies all the time, the outer Mongols had a more peaceful life. Tibetan Buddhism was booming, and the entire region was under the leadership of Zanabazal, the supreme spiritual authority of outer Mongolia. It has something to do with Tibetan Buddhism in Mongolia, which I will explain in a different video, but for now, you only need to know that Zanabazal to outer Mongolia is like the Pope to Europe. But their peace was not to last very long because the Western Mongols suddenly rose to power and founded the Drunga Khanate. Their empire expanded very quickly. By 1688, the Drunga Mongols had taken over the Terran base in the south and expanded into Outer Mongolia. Zanabat tried to talk it over with the Drungas to stop their attack, but that didn't work out and the war escalated. It was a very desperate time for the Outer Mongols and eventually, Zanabat called for desperate measures. He asked Manchus for help. At the time, the ruler of Qin was Hong Teji's grandson, Emperor Kangxi, and he had been trying to control Outer Mongolia for years. And this attack from Junga Mongols did him a great favor as it left Outer Mongolia without a chance to remain independent. And unlike Junga Khan, who didn't get along with Zanabatl, Kangxi admired him. He promised to protect Outer Mongolia from the Junga's. So in 1691, under Zanabatl's authority, Outer Mongolia submitted to the Qin Empire, and Kangxi kept his word, defeated the Dringa Mongols, and pushed them back to Dringaria. Following the victory, all Mongol tribes north of the Gobi were incorporated into Qin. And this is how the Outer Mongolia was formed. You're probably wondering now, okay, you've covered Inner Mongols and Outer Mongols, but what happened to the Dringa Mongols and the Upper Mongols? Well, long story short, they were both crushed by the Manchus and had their territories annexed into the Qing Empire. The Upper Mongols were conquered by Kangxi's son, Yongzheng, in the 1720s, and 40% of his population was killed. The Dringa Khanate was wiped out in 1758 by Kangxi's grandson, Qianlong, who ordered the genocide of the Dringa Mongols. About 80% of the Dringa population, close to a million people, was killed. The Dringa genocide was widely believed to be the most devastating genocide of the 18th century. But apparently, Qianlong really enjoyed this conquest, and even had people draw these killing scenes. That genocide is why there are so few Mongols in Western China today. Their population never recovered. Once brought under Qing control, the Mongol clan structures were replaced by the Manchu banner system, it has a drastic impact on the Mongolian culture. As Manchu authorities chose the leader of each banner, the ties between Mongol tribes were weakened. Also, Mongols were forbidden from crossing the borders of their banners to keep the Mongol tribes isolated and disconnected. And of course, any rebellions against the Manchu government would be crushed without mercy. Those 200 years under Manchu's control were not pleasant memories for the other Mongols. When I was in Mongolia, the most popular movie was actually one about Mongols' humiliating history under the Manchus. I watched it and was very impressed. The thing that I really like about Mongolia is the land. It's vast and empty. And so primitive that there's no trace of human existence for just hundreds of miles down that way. It's beautiful. It's, uh, that explains a lot. Explains the uh, personality of these nomad people, and of course the amount of love they have for this land. It's just look at it. It's so vast. That's the definition of being vast. By the late 19th century. The Russian and the Japanese Empire had become the new superpowers in East Asia, and they were both hungry for more land and control. To slow down Japan and Russia's plan of eating up its territories, the Qing government decided to quickly populate the empty lands in Manchuria and Inner Mongolia by moving millions of Chinese from China proper. And this plan totally backfired. The newly arrived Chinese turned the steppes and forests into farmlands, greatly disrupting the Mongolian way of life. Tensions between the Mongols and the Chinese quickly escalated. And in November 1891, all hell 
broke loose. Chinese rebels revolted in Inner Mongolia. Their attack started at Zhou De League and rampaged south. Meanwhile, another group of rebels attacked Zhou De League. Within 10 days, the Chinese rebels slaughtered more than 10,000 Mongols and destroyed a thousand villages, forcing 100,000 Inner Mongols to leave their homes to take refuge in northern banners near Xing'an Mountains. In total, over 150,000 Inner Mongols died in the massacre. The shock of this massacre spread to the whole of the Mongolian society, eventually galvanizing the Mongolian independence and self-determination movement. On December 29, 1911, the eighth Book the Gagin took the title Book the Han and declared the independence of Outer Mongolia. Little did Mongolians know their struggle for independence had just got started. The new state was purely theocratic and the religious leaders knew nothing about how to run a country. Government spending and taxation on the people were outrageous. Things went out of control immediately. In 1912, the very first year of their independence, the Mongolian government, to restore Bokhtang's eyesight, bought 10,000 Buddha statuettes and an 84 feet tall Buddha statue and built a temple to house it. Imagine how much this would cost the taxpayers. And that was just year one. Then there was the Republic of China, which succeeded the Qing and tried to reintegrate Outer Mongolia. Russians in the north only made the matter more confusing. They wouldn't recognize Mongolia's sovereignty, but sent troops to help ensure Outer Mongolia's autonomy within China. So in 1915, a strange treaty was signed between the Russian Empire, the Republic of China, and Mongolia, recognizing Mongolia's autonomy within China, but under direct Russian control. However, less than two years after the signing of that treaty, the Bolsheviks came to power, and the Russian Empire collapsed. Chinese seized the opportunity and reoccupied Outer Mongolia for about two years. Then the anti-Bolshevik Russians came over and recaptured Mongolia for a couple of months. And then the Bolsheviks came with the Red Army in 1921 and re-reoccupied Mongolia. It was a mess. Three years later, in 1924, Bogdan died, and the first Mongolian regime died with him. With the help of the Soviets, the Mongolian People's Republic was founded. Got some groceries and uh, I'm about to make myself some pretty good lunch. Here, tangerine and some bread. This is gonna go great with the hot pot. That's my hot pot sauce and the meat. Last night I took the train, five hour train from Xinhout to uh, Ernhout. I barely ate anything. I didn't eat much this morning, so I need a very good lunch. And I need alcohol. This is so good! Despite being short-lived, the Bogdan government did attempt to reunite Inner Mongolia. In 1912, right after the Qing Empire collapsed, one Inner Mongol leader reached out to Bogdan for help and declared the independence of Eastern Mongolia. Soon, many Inner Mongols joined his forces. Together, they tried to push the Chinese army out of Inner Mongolia, but were defeated within a month. However, that was not the end of it because by the end of 1912, Bogdan's army had arrived. The Outer Mongols, with Russia's help, defeated the Chinese and occupied Inner Mongolia by October 1913. But after the negotiations with the Chinese, the Russians suddenly changed their mind and stopped supplying the Outer Mongol army. Without aid and supplies from Russia, the Outer Mongols were quickly pushed back and failed to reunify Inner Mongolia. Mongolia under the Soviet Union went through drastic and bloody reforms. After rounds of ruthless purges, Chebasan became the head of the state and plunged the entire country into chaos. Within 18 months between 1937 and 1939, Chebasan, following Stalin's order, executed over 17,000 lamas. Monks that were not executed were forcibly laicized, and 746 of the country's monasteries were demolished. 3 to 5 percent of Mongolia's total population was thought to have perished during the repression. 
behind me is the uh, ruins of Manchur Heed. This place was one of the most important monasteries in Mongolia. But sadly, in 1937, Stalin and his Soviet army destroyed everything. It was once home to more than 350 lamas, but now it's uh, completely empty. So yeah, after Qing Empire collapsed, a lot had happened to the Outer Mongols. What about the Inner Mongols? Well, a lot happened. So the collapse of the Qing Empire left a huge power vacuum in China. Chinese warlords fought each other for 16 years until 1928, when the nationalist government under Chiang Kai-shek finally reunified China. And as soon as the nationalist government took over, Inner Mongolia was sliced into four provinces. Mongols were furious and demanded autonomy. Chiang Kai-shek sent people to negotiate, but failed to appease the Mongols. Meanwhile, Japan captured Manchuria and formed a new nation called Manchukuo in 1932. The Inner Mongol leaders, disappointed in the nationalist government, started working with the Japanese, who promised them autonomy. And sure enough, within three years, Japan had defeated the Chinese army in central Inner Mongolia and founded the Mengjiang United Autonomous Government for the Inner Mongols. Before World War II was over, almost all Inner Mongols lived in Eastern Mengjiang or Manchukuo under direct Japanese control. Preoccupied with wars elsewhere, the Japanese mostly left the Inner Mongols alone. There were no purges, religion was safe, and the old social structure was untouched. However, clashes between Japanese-backed Manchukuo and Soviet-backed Mongolia occurred frequently along the border. The initial clashes quickly escalated to an all-out war, with over 100,000 combatants, 600 tanks, and over a thousand aircraft. The war started in May 1939 and ended four months later with a decisive victory by the Soviet Mongolian army. Later, the Mongolian Manchukuo border was demarcated by the requirements of the Soviet Union and Outer Mongolia, and the conflict ended with the signing of the Soviet Japanese Neutrality Treaty. After World War II, the International Military Tribunal for the Far East stated that it was unnecessary to redefine this border, and that was how it got its bizarre looking line going into Lake Beer. Hello and welcome to Mulun. Here's another statue dedicated to the Soviet Red Army who fought for Mongolia. I think this is one of the most legendary uh, wrestler in the history of Mongolia. see a uh, wrestling competition quite emotional actually young wrestlers they are practicing every day they actually do fight for their lives and that is something that deeply deeply touched me you want you want something you fight for your life by the summer of 1945 the tide of war had turned on August 6, 1945, the United States dropped an atomic bomb on Hiroshima and another one on Nagasaki three days later. At about the same time, the Soviet Union and Mongolia declared war on Japan. The 1.5 million strong Soviet Mongolian army swept over Manchukuo and Mengjiang. On August 15, 1945, Japan 
surrendered. The Soviet Mongolian troops occupied Manchuria and Inner Mongolia for almost a year before returning them to the Chinese. And here comes the part that baffled me the most, because you see, for about a year, the Soviet Union and Mongolia occupied Inner Mongolia and Manchuria. The Outer Mongols army was now literally in Inner Mongolia, and the Chinese couldn't do anything about it because the Soviets were there as well. Wouldn't this be an excellent opportunity to reunite the two Mongolias? What was stopping this reunification? Something must have gone terribly wrong. But what exactly went wrong? It turned out the Soviets didn't declare war on Japan unconditionally. I mean, the two had just entered the Neutrality Pact in 1941. In theory, the two shall not declare war against each other for at least five years until 1946. But one event in 1945 changed Stalin's mind. The Yalta Conference. In February 1945, Stalin had a meeting with FDR and Churchill these two wanted him to enter the war against Japan to end the war sooner. In the end, Stalin agreed to declare war on Japan with conditions. So he came up with a list. Right here, I just printed it out. It's just one page and uh, you can see the signatures here. And the final answer to our question is on this list. Hidden in the very first line. Uh, I'm gonna try to read this in Russian. Uh, please forgive my horrible pronunciation. Sakhalinia status quo of Russian Mongolia. Which says, maintaining the status quo of Outer Mongolia. Because of this one line, Mongolia has become an independent country. <laughs> And it was also this one line that stopped the unification of the two Mongolias. Because the status quo here didn't just apply politically, it also applied geographically, meaning that the size of Mongolia shall remain the same as well. And the annexation of Inner Mongolia, which would inevitably increase its size, would certainly violate the Yarta Accord. And you might be wondering now, was this a joke or something? Did Stalin make a mistake on those terms? I'm afraid not. On the contrary, it was by Soviet's meticulous design that Inner Mongolia shall never reunify with Outer Mongolia. Because despite helping Outer Mongols gain independence, the Russian governments, both Imperial and the USSR, discouraged any form of Pan-Mongolism. Because this unification would not only have a huge impact on the Buyat and Halamuk Mongol community in Russia, bringing unnecessary instability, but would also further incur the wrath of the Chinese, who had just accepted the fact that Outer Mongolia is gone for real this time. And obviously, a lot of Soviet soldiers died defending Mongolia, and to thank them, the Mongolians built this monument. Your precious life in us continue, your glorious deeds in life immortal. Nazi Germany. That's the uh, anti-Japanese war. But the Inner Mongols had absolutely no idea. All they knew was that the Japanese were gone, other Mongols and the Soviets were here, the Chinese were fighting themselves again. Naturally, the Inner Mongols were confused. They were like, okay, what now? Where should we go? We have all this land and people. Do we join the Soviet Union? Do we join the communist Chinese? Do we join the nationalist Chinese? Do we join our brothers and sisters in the north, or shall we form a country ourselves? 
You see, it was a very confusing time between the Mongols. But despite all the confusion, they act quickly. Within three months, three different Inner Mongolian governments were formed and declared either autonomy or independence. The first Inner Mongolia government was formed in Eastern Inner Mongolia on August 18, 1945, the same day Manchukuo surrendered. These Inner Mongols really cared about timing. They were not like, okay folks, the Japanese are gone, let's party, let's have a drink, let's take one day off. Not for them, they went back to work straight away. They sent representatives to Ulaanbaatar and proposed the reunification of Inner and Outer Mongolia. But the Soviet Union and Mongolia rejected them for fear of violating Yalta Accord. The second Inner Mongolia government was formed in late August 1945 in central Inner Mongolia. Also proposed the reunification of two Mongolias, sent representatives to Outer Mongolia, and they too were rejected. But they wouldn't give up, so they declared independence instead and founded the Inner Mongolian People's Republic and sent representatives to Outer Mongolia and the Soviet Union again, hoping to be recognized as a country with sovereignty. But again, they were rejected. The third Inner Mongolia government was formed in Northern Manchuria in September 1945 and declared autonomy. They then sent representatives to contact the Republic of China government, hoping that the Chinese authorities would recognize their autonomy. But their proposal was also rejected. So yeah, the Inner Mongols tried basically everything they could to reach out to the Outer Mongols multiple times within three months. But the answers from Outer Mongolia were always the same. No and no. Not because Outer Mongols didn't want Inner Mongols to join them. As a matter of fact, they wanted to reunite with Inner Mongols more than anything. Trebasan's final hope was to reunite with Inner Mongolia. But Stalin just wouldn't allow it. After knowing that reunification was no longer possible, Trebasan instead called Mongols in China to migrate to Outer Mongolia. But the Soviet army blocked the migration route. Uh, I'm afraid I have to cook for two straight days, about five meals. Because none of the restaurants are open. This is so called a universal seasoning. I've never heard anything half so beautiful. Success. Now that all the Inner Mongols knew they couldn't reunite with Outer Mongols, and no one was going to support their independence idea, so they kind of have to pick a side between the nationalist Chinese and the communist Chinese. So in early 1946, they approached the nationalist government for the second time, demanding autonomy. The nationalist government was angered by this proposal and believed Stalin was behind it. The communists, on the other hand, were trying everything they could to win over the Inner Mongols. So after learning that the Inner Mongols had founded an autonomous government, the communists sent a congratulatory message and promised autonomy. Later, the communist government sent its own Mongol representative to Inner Mongolia. And to everyone's surprise, this guy did a terrific job because in less than two years, he single-handedly brought Inner Mongolia to the communist government. His name was Lan Hu. In April 1947, after rounds of meetings with the three Inner Mongolian governments, Lan Hu combined them into one and founded the Inner Mongolia Autonomous Government. Two years later, after the People's Republic of China was founded, it was renamed Inner Mongolia Autonomous Region. 
and Wu Lanhu was its founding chairman. When Inner Mongolia Autonomous Region was established, it looked like this. But as the communists consolidated control over China, Inner Mongolia expanded westwards. In 1949, the Jilin League and Jawud League were incorporated into Inner Mongolia. Between 1952 and 1956, all these lands were incorporated into Inner Mongolia. So, unlike the nationalist government that divided Inner Mongolia into four provinces in 1928, the communist government kept its word and brought all the Inner Mongols' lands together under one gigantic autonomous region with a size bigger than the United Kingdom, France, and Germany combined. The Inner Mongols were very happy with this result. They got their autonomy. The region developed rapidly for nearly 20 years until 1966. And all hell broke loose. After People's Republic of China was founded, Mao carried out the first and second five-year plans to quickly industrialize the country. But due to the lack of experience, both plans failed, causing nationwide famine and deaths of millions. This immeasurable loss worried China's top leadership. Mao's position became precarious. Worse still, after Stalin died in 1953, Sino-Soviet relations broke down rapidly. Mao didn't want to be marginalized, of course. What would you do if you were him? You would do exactly what these guys do: purge the hell out of your country. And so the purge began in 1966, and lasted a decade. Tens of millions of Chinese were purged, including many notable officials. Such as the chairman of Inner Mongolia, Wu Lanhu. Ironically, his alleged crime was the attempt to make Inner Mongolia an independent country. Yeah, they accused the guy who literally stopped Inner Mongolia from becoming an independent country of trying to make Inner Mongolia an independent country. That didn't make much sense to me at all. But nothing made any sense during the purge. And Inner Mongolia, like the rest of China, was devastated. Waves of repression were initiated against the Inner Mongols. From June 1967 to May 1969, at least 500,000 people were imprisoned. 27,900 were persecuted to death, and more than 120,000 people were disabled. Among the victims, 75% were Mongols, even though they only made up 10% of the population. And like Outer Mongolia, most of the temples were razed to the ground. In 1969, in response to the threat of the Soviet Union and to prevent a potential unification of Inner and Outer Mongolia, Chinese authorities completely shattered this autonomous region. Within a matter of days, two thirds of Inner Mongolia disappeared. Go. Hello, viewers. Since I just、uh, fucked up my video mic、uh, yesterday on the mountain top, now I have to hold a phone from time to time to be my mic. Ah,、uh, God, this is so cold, unbelievably cold, and I'm just wearing more and more stuff every single day. I think I just found one guy walking on the ice. That's completely insane because the ice is melting now, and、uh, if he falls through,、uh, I will be the only one who knows about it, and <laughs> I won't be able to go rescue him. That guy was. Crossing the ice lake, he actually just made it, and he didn't even wet himself. Incredible. Behind me is one of the、uh, defunct Mongolian boat. The absolutely unforgiving climate will destroy everything. It's only a matter of time. So yesterday there was no sign of snow, and today all of a sudden it was just. I think there's a storm. I think 
Kicker song right now. It's just incredible. There's so many Mongolia I can get. You know, it's just 20 less than 12 hours. It's not okay. Meanwhile, in Mongolia, things were less dramatic. Following Che Basen's death in 1952, Che Denbao became the leader of Mongolia for the next 32 years. His foreign policy was quite straightforward, to bring Mongolia into ever closer cooperation with the Soviets. Che Denbao went so far that he submitted requests to incorporate Mongolia into the Soviet Union more than five times but the Soviet leaders rejected those proposals. At the time of the Sino-Soviet split, Tsitin Bell sided with the Soviets. Under his authority, the Soviet Union stationed troops and missiles all over Mongolia to guard against the Chinese. In return, the Soviets increased their investment in Mongolia, building cities and factories. Not a big fan of Lenin. ago I just made it to the third largest city in Mongolia. This is the top of the city of Erdenit, the third largest city in Mongolia and one of the youngest settlements in the country. It was founded in 1974 because a really large copper mine was discovered here. It's actually the fourth largest copper mine in the world. So in the mid-1980s, a lot of Russian engineers and miners lived here. Over 50% of the population were Russians. <laughs> there are two Mongolian girls behind me talking, keep talking and looking at me, and I'm kind of embarrassed. Um, so this friendship monument was erected in 1986 by the Soviets. And uh, because the city itself, Erdent, was basically a result of the uh, Mongolian and Russian friendship. So throughout the city, you can see a lot of monuments like this. <laughs> As Sino-Soviet relations normalized in the 1980s, Tadimbel, still staunchly anti-Chinese, was forced into retirement. In 1986, Mongolia-China relations were finally normalized. You know, from the stories of all these Mongol leaders, you can kind of see the dilemma faced by the two Mongolias. Their leaders are not chosen or judged by how well they serve the Mongolian people, but by how well they serve the narrative of this ever-changing Sino-Russian relations. If they cooperate, they stay. If they don't, they go away. And it was in this process of balancing Russia and China that Inner Mongolia and Outer Mongolia drifted further and further away from each other. After Sino-Soviet relation was eased, Inner Mongolia restored its administrative divisions in 1979. Peace finally came back to this troubled land. Chairman Wu Lanhu was rehabilitated and later became the vice chairman of China. Three generations of his family have ruled Inner Mongolia for over 65 years till now. The only family that can revel this record in East Asia is the Kim family from North Korea. 
Since China passed opening up policy in 1978, Inner Mongolia has developed rapidly. From 1978 to 2017, the regional GDP increased from $815 million to $225 billion, with an average annual growth rate of 11.7%. The Mongolian population recovered and now more Mongols live in Inner Mongolia than in the actual country of Mongolia. However, this considerable development has come at a cost, with huge amounts of pollution, degradation of grasslands, and rapid sanitization. By 2023, only three out of the nine original leaks of Inner Mongolia remained. Jovd League was dissolved in 1983. Jilim League was dissolved in 1999. After 2000, four more leaks were dissolved. According to the 2010 census, 80% of Inner Mongolia's population, about 20 million people, was Han Chinese. The 4.22 million Mongolians only made up 17% of the population. The fast synthesization of Inner Mongolia after 1978 inevitably exacerbated ethnic tensions, with many Mongolians feeling they were increasingly marginalized in their homeland, leading to mass protests. The most recent one happened in September 2020 when the Inner Mongolia Department of Education reformed the curriculum imposed on Mongolian schools. Three subjects that were taught in Mongolian are now taught in Chinese. This caused large demonstrations in both Mongolias and reflected the decline of Mongolian language education in China. But despite having more Han Chinese in the cities, the Mongolian lifestyle and culture are well preserved in towns and villages. When I traveled to the countryside of Inner Mongolia, I could only hear Mongolian on the streets. Kids from every age group spoke Mongolian fluently. This is the local Mongolian school. What a lovely morning. So good. Mongolia, on the other hand, didn't do too well after the dissolution of the Soviet Union in 1991. Trade with Russia declined by over 80%. A new constitution was implemented in 1992 and reformed the country. However, the transition to a market economy wasn't easy. During the 90s, the government had to deal with high inflation and food shortages. In the early 2000s, extreme weather caused economic decline. And in 2008, the financial crisis crushed its economy once again. In 2022, Mongolia's GDP was $41 billion, while Inner Mongolia had a GDP eight times larger. In fact, the capital city of Inner Mongolia, Hurkhod, alone had a larger GDP than the entire country of Mongolia. Russia rebuilt strong relations with Mongolia in early 2000s, lowered the prices of energy exports to Mongolia, and enhanced cross-border trade. The Russian government even rolled off 98% of Mongolia's state debt to support its economy. China has also supported Mongolia by becoming its biggest trade partner and source of foreign investment. But despite getting help from both neighbors, Mongolia is still finding its own way. In this country, you can see constructions everywhere. It's still a relatively young economy, I think. And uh, I don't know about you, but I think it's full of energy and future, and opportunity. But to be honest, Mongolia doesn't have many options. Being a landlocked country with only two neighbors, one being its biggest importer, and the other its biggest exporter, Mongolia effectively has no other choice but trade very lightly in the years ahead as they continue balancing between Russia to their north and China to their south. And with the war in Ukraine going on, the economic and political ties between Europe and Russia are cut off. 
making Sino-Russian relations closer and stronger than ever. Mongolia caught in the middle inevitably becomes the bridge. Were Mongolia to refuse all cooperation with Russia and China, Mongolia's 3.3 million people and its vast empty lands would likely be taken over by force again, just as they were more than 300 years ago. But the good news is that, after 70 years of division and hostility, Mongols from these three countries are now closer than ever. <laughs> Mongolians can travel to China and Russia visa-free for 30 days. Every day, hundreds of Mongolians arrive in Inner Mongolia to do business, go to school, visit friends and families. On my recent trip to Mongolia, I met many Inner Mongols from China going to school in Ulaanbaatar and many Buryats from Russia doing business. I had a great time talking to you and learning from them. Yeah? Очень красивая девушка. Yeah, right. Maybe not that. Being with them and seeing Mongols across three nations speak the same language and share the same culture meant a lot to me. Because by the end of the day, that is the only thing that truly matters. Politics is filthy, always has been and always will be. But people, people are beautiful. Next, Japan, Chow, Mongol, Chow, Tir, Amerik, Chow, Ars, Chow, Nick, Bukteri, Tir, Dikini, Tir, Dikini. Okay, folks, we have arrived at the end of the journey. Thanks for sticking around. Honestly, not many people are interested in the history of two Mongolias, but hey, now you know something most people don't. Speaking of the Mongols, there is actually another province in China with a large Mongolian population. The story of that province is extremely lesser known. It is China's biggest, least populated, most deadly, and most important province. If you're interested, you can watch it here. And if you'd like to know more about the Sino-Russian relations and the super complicated Eurasian history behind it, you can check out this uh, three-part documentary I made. Thank you so much for tuning in. Subscribe if you're not already, and I will see you in the next one. Cheers.